And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am thrilled to have the incredible Jennifer McMahon joining us live from Vermont to talk about her brand new book, The Drowning Kind. Jennifer, welcome. Tell us about your book. Yay, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting to be here. Yay. Um, so The Drowning Kind has two storylines. Uh, the first storyline takes place in the present day where we meet social worker Jackie, who has just learned that her daughter, or her, not, not her daughter, her sister has drowned in the old family swimming pool back at her grandmother's estate in Vermont. So Jackie gets on a plane and goes back home and she's been estranged from her sister and they haven't really spoken much in the past year. And she's just devastated and grief stricken and she's trying to put things together and trying to make sense of this tragedy and trying to figure out what her sister was up to in the weeks before her death. Mm. And she starts going through her sister's papers and discovers that her sister was looking into their family history, but not just the history of their family, but also the history of the place, of the land and the old house and the springs behind. There's a, swim, a spring fed swimming pool behind the house. And these springs are long rumored to grant wishes and Jackie's just becoming very, very involved in this whole process. And then we have another story woven into this one that starts back in 1929, where we meet Ethel. And Ethel is 37, newly married, very happy. She loves her husband very much. He's a town doctor. But the one thing she wants most in the world is to have a child. And she and her husband have so far been an, unable to have a baby and she hasn't been able to conceive and she's starting to feel like something's wrong with her and she's doing all these crazy things to try to get pregnant and nothing's working. And she's starting to worry that it's her, but she's afraid to actually say the words out loud to her husband. And her husband can tell she's getting stressed. And he says, you know what? Let's go, let's have a lovely romantic weekend away. A new hotel has just opened in Vermont called the Brandenburg Springs Hotel and Resort. Mm. And, she, and they go and the highlight of the hotel are the springs. There are springs behind the hotel that are rumored to cure the sick and fix you and rejuvenate you and regenerate you. But also Ethel learns when she gets there, they're also rumored to grant wishes. And what's the thing she wishes for most? A child. So she kind of goes back and forth and she, she finds her way out to the pool on her own and she thinks, do I do it? Do I not do it? This is silly. Who makes wishes to the water? And in the end she does. She gets down and she makes her wish. And she and Jackie both realized sort of over the course of the, the novel that you have to be careful what you wish for. Mm. Well, Jennifer McMahon, you have hooked us. <laughs> we are here for it. And we need to know every single delicious detail of this book. So let's get into it. But first, I just want to pause and welcome all of our friends, fam, and mystery and thriller fans on Facebook. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. If you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, here's the drill. Every Tuesday, I present you with two fabulous, fascinating authors, and you get to ask them anything. This is a collaborative conversation. So just get your questions, comments, thoughts, everything going uh, in the comments. You know how it is. Uh, this is the Vegas of mystery and thrillers. So what happens on Mighty Mysteries stays on Mighty Mysteries. So let's have, uh, let's, let's say, let's say hello. So welcome, Leslie. She's saying hi. Welcome, Christine. Tina. Hi, Christina. Great. Welcome back. Welcome, Cheryl. Welcome, everybody. So good to have you. Welcome, Sylvia. She says, I'm on chapter 24 of the audiobook, and I so appreciate the cadence of the two readers differentiating centuries. Let's pause there and talk about that. Why two points of view? Why a century apart? Um, so I began the book with just the present day storyline. I began the book with just the story of Jackie and her sister and like Jackie trying to piece together the, what her sister had been studying and learning about the, about the land. And I thought, I really need to not just tell what happened a century ago and not tell about the hotel that used to be there. I need to show someone going to the hotel. Ooh. So then I got really excited and I started this other storyline. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go back to 1929. And I'm going to show a couple going to visit the hotel. It's newly opened. I'm going to really show this hotel and it's a magical place. There's peacocks roaming the ground. There's gorgeous rose gardens. Mm. It's like, it's the nicest place in Vermont. And so I'm writing it and I, st and I came up with the character of Ethel and I started writing, but I am not a, um, a plotter or a planner. So I don't outline and I had absolutely no idea how these two storylines were connected. 
I knew that they were connected by the place. I knew that they were connected by the, the land and the pool and that that would carry through to both storylines. But I didn't know beyond that. I had to keep writing my way through to figure it out. And then once I realized it was like, oh, and then the whole book kind of started to come together. I know Ooh. it's a crazy way to work, isn't it? You're making faces like, wow. No, it's, it's I am in awe way. because I am also not a plotter. Um, but that has gotten me in some tight spaces. Yeah. So basically, I you know have written the length of two books, and now because I kept going down these alleys and then having to back, back, back my way out, and then go down, plunge down another alley yep. with wild abandon, and then have to back it out. Yeah. And so it's it's effing brutal. So, but yeah. it clearly didn't happen yeah. to you. Because oh no, it did. I mean, you, it did. I mean, it did. You know, I definitely got down those alleys and I definitely reached dead ends and I definitely was like what is this what is even happening it's just it's all part of the process and be, because I write this way I do a lot of rewriting after you know once I got to the point of realizing how the storylines were connected I had to go back and fix some things and be like oh okay well now I need to restructure this and restructure that and yeah Ooh, that is fascinating yeah. I absolutely love that so you did have to go back and and rewrite I do, yes. So I, what I, but that was after my first goal in every book is to get out a really messy, really crappy first draft. Ooh, and okay. I have to write my way through to the end. Even, you know, in this book, I, fi I figured out probably about halfway through what the connection was with the two storylines. And I got really excited and I wanted to go back and start weaving in all this other stuff. And I was like, no, 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 no. I have to go forward, get to the end. And once I've got a draft, then I can go back and fix everything. And that's when I that's when I do my outlining and my plotting and my planning and I make sure I tighten everything up and I make sure there are no holes. And I actually um, I print my whole first draft out and lay it over the floor of my house to really get a, a true concept of how the story works and the kind of bird's eye view of the story itself. And I start moving things around. I'm like, oh, well, this chapter obviously belongs in the beginning and this chapter doesn't belong in here at all. And I'm missing something here and I need to tell more about Ethel here and yeah. It's, Ooh, yeah. that is fascinating. So you print it out and lay it down. I mean, do you have any dogs, cats, or other humans that live there? Yeah. Do they have that go flying? I am. It's not a good thing in my house. <laughs> you know, my, so I make my daughter and her friends stay out of the stay out of the living room. It's the, my living room and dining room these days that get covered. The cats definitely have a lot of fun, and I think of them as like my little editors. If like Amelia the cat comes in and gets rid of a chapter or like messes up a chapter, I think, oh well, maybe she's right. I don't know. Um, but honestly, <laughs> so I'm one of those people. We adopted a dog during the pandemic, so yeah. I have not done this process yet with our new dog. So I don't. That's going to add a whole new level of chaos so I'm not sure how it's going to go but I'm going to have to find a way to do it because I've done it with every book and it's a big part of my process so she might just be banned from the living room and dining room for a few hours here and there yeah so the cat is kind of an editor then mixing up the pages and absolutely <laughs> sharing her feline wisdom sharing, that's right that's right and I actually I did put a cat in this book too there's a cat pig the cat yeah. And I saw in your author notes at the end that the cat was was not always there, that an editor suggested the cat. Yes, yes. The cat was not always there. No, the Ooh, cat was not always there. You she like was like, what if, yeah, I know. She was like, what if they had a cat? What if there's a cat? And I said, what if there's a cat? That's a great idea. Oh, my yeah. God. Okay, that's going to be my new line. What if there's a cat? What if there's like, a cat? Hey, Sarah, want to go to there. dinner? What if there's a cat? What if there's a cat? Sarah, what do, you, what do you want for lunch? What if there's a cat? <laughs> That's great. I am gonna, I'm going to use, oh, my my Alexa is going off. My Siri mother. <laughs> Karen is saying she loved this book. Karen, hey, you and oh, me thank too. you, Karen. Yay, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Karen, tell us what you loved about it in the comments. Whitney's saying she loved the book. And clearly, Whitney loves dogs because there's a beautiful profile a picture beautiful with that doggy. adorable little puppy. Yeah. Karen, team dog over here girl um oh good question from cheryl what genre would you say this oh. book is yes jennifer what do you think because what do i think horrible, yeah you got thriller you got supernatural you got a ghost component yeah what do you think of it as i think of my books as psychological suspense with uh supernatural twist i don't know that's the best i got but okay, it does one have more time so we can really take that in okay uh, psychological suspense with a supernatural twist. What do okay, you think? I don't know. Psychological but... suspense yeah. with a supernatural twist. Yeah. What do you think? Do you I think, think it that work? works. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what you, that's what your goal is. Psychological suspense with a supernatural twist. And that's what you, that's what you, that's what you like. That's what you go for. What do you think, Cheryl? Does that work? 
let us know. Yeah, in the, let us in the know. Comments. And I'm I'm always interested to hear what other people think because some people think, oh, you, well, you write horror. You write like Shirley Jackson kind of horror, and I love that. That is like high praise for me because I just love Shirley Jackson. Your um, fellow Vermonter there, I Shirley know. Jackson, Queen Shirley. My God, Queen. that is very high praise. And actually, that ended up in one of your blurbs. We're going to get to that next. Kelly is saying she loved the book. Kelly, Kelly thanks thank for you. joining us. Thanks for yeah. your comment. Uh, we appreciate that so much. Kelly's also saying that she loves your Instagram photos of your notes. She's totally guilty of zooming in. Tell us about, tell us about that. Yeah, I have a lot of fun sharing my process. Um, you know, like put, I take pictures of that book on the floor process and I take pictures of whatever stage I'm at, you know, the book on the floor process, the brainstorming with index cards process, the like making big mind maps on sheets of newsprint, um, the post-it notes all over the wall, wherever I'm at with the book, I like to, I like to share the process with people and to show that, you know, it's all part of the process and sometimes it's messy and chaotic, but it's what gets me there. <laughs> and I love and sharing my index cards. I'm an index card junk <laughs> So I just put it in the comments for everyone who's who's not following Jennifer yet. Follow her on Instagram. I just put it in the comments so that you too, like Kelly, can be spying on Jennifer and <laughs> zooming in. I do the same thing, Kelly. I'm so glad you said it out loud. Thanks for admitting it because now we can all say we do it too. Because they'll when authors tease, you know, oh, here's a little, you know, uh, preview of my next book. I'm hashtag editing. And then it's something really far away so that you yeah. can't see what it is. Oh, I screenshot. And then I zoom in. And then zoom. Zoom. <laughs> Kelly, you and me, the same. <laughs> well, I, I think I should give prizes to anyone who can actually read any of my handwritten notes because they're such chicken scratch. I sometimes can't read them. So it's like, I, I feel a little bit like people are going to think I'm even more of a crazy person than they might for seeing all the notes. It's like when, if they actually zoom in and they're like, what the heck is that even, what does that even say? Does it say water or does it say Wanda? What is she saying? What is she even <laughs> writing there? I don't know. Well, if we see a wand in your, in your next character, in your next book, we'll know. That's right. <laughs> um, Cheryl is saying that psychological suspense with a supernatural twist is perfect. Cheryl, oh, thank you so okay. much for, for chiming awesome. in. Whitney's saying, also, do you always, did you always know it was going to end that way? The ending blew my mind. The ending also blew my mind. Whitney, did you read it twice? Because I did. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, so yeah, tell so, us. If yeah, being, being not a plotter. Um, or outliner, I had no, I never have any idea. I had no idea how this book was going to end. I had no idea what was going on with the water. I had no idea. You know, I just didn't know. I didn't know how things were going to end. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what Jackie was going to discover. I didn't know what Ethel's storyline was going to be and what was going to happen with her. I had to write my way through to the end and then figure it out. And at the end, I rewrote several times. And we had a lot of my editor and I had some discussions about if this is the right way to end it. And I really believed it was. And it was, it was what I felt was right. It was the way that the book wanted to end. And I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I, you know, I went back, I wrote a couple of different alternate endings, but this was the one that first came to me. And this was what my heart told me the book wanted, to, you know, it was, it was the natural resolution I felt like to the story. Ooh, Jennifer, yeah. let me ask you, so you wrote this book with some supernatural uh, elements. Um, do you ever feel that you're being guided by the spirit of the water, the spirit of the book? Um, since you don't plot, since you're saying that this is how the book wanted to be written, is is who is who's guiding you? Who is telling you how that should be written? Tell us. Oh about wow, that. this is going to get creepy here. <laughs> um, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I do feel like I feel like my characters are guiding me. Honestly, I feel like once I get in touch with them, they'll take me on the journey. And in this particular book, the water itself it was a character, right? Like I treat my setting like a character and the water took on, it became its own character. It was very much personified. And so much so that I actually did, I, I do character studies while I'm writing for the characters in my book to kind of get to know them. And I inter one of the things I do is I pull out my journal and I interview my characters and I keep asking questions and I have them write, well, I'm writing the answer, but I have them answer me in my head and I'm writing, I'm kind of channeling them and I'm writing everything down that they tell me. And I totally did this for the water. And I was like, what's your deal? What's down there? What is it that you want? And so the, some of the questions I ask my characters, including the water are, what do you want most? What do you fear? And what's the one thing you've never told anyone? So I asked that of everyone and I asked that of the water and the water was pretty evasive. It, the water didn't want to give me the right, the, the water kind of kept drawing me around in circles and not really wanting to answer, but I got some answers eventually. 
around in circles, around in water circles. Ooh, like yeah. a spiraling, <laughs> uh, you know, the black hole that sucks you down. I just want to make sure I understand. Um, oh, Leslie's saying it's so cool that you interview the characters. So I just want to make sure I understand. You interview the you interview the characters and you ask the characters and the water. What are what are the three questions that you ask the ask them? I ask the question. I ask what they're most afraid of, what they want most. I ask, I have a whole list of questions. What they most, what they're most afraid of, what they want most, what's the one thing they've never told anyone. Oh. That's, that's always the big question that kind of turns the whole story on its head and gets the most out of characters. But I kind of have to warm them up to it first when I'm doing my little interviews with them. And then I pop that. And I'll be like, what did you have for dinner last night? What's your favorite pair of shoes? What's the one thing you never told anyone? Oh. And then oh. that answer usually will, will change things around for me and give me true insight. And then once I start like really hearing the voice of whatever character it is in my head and writing down the answers they're giving me really fast, I'm like, I've got it. I've got this character. I know what makes them tick. I understand. <gasps> Ooh, those are juicy questions. I mean, yeah. I'm just thinking if someone asked me, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that out to the audience. How would you answer these questions? You know, I mean, that's yeah. so those are tough <laughs> questions. Those are tough questions. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself those questions? Um, some of them. <laughs> Have I answered myself? <laughs> Oh my goodness. No. Oh wow, Jennifer. This is this is this is really this is so cool. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anybody's questions. Okay, Cheryl was saying that she was thinking gothic too. Um, very cool. Thank you. Uh thank you, Cheryl, and thank you, Sylvia. Yay for gothic. Gail says great to be here. Sorry, she's late. Gail, hey, top community member. Welcome. welcome to have you. So welcome. We're so thrilled to have you as always. Ooh, Kelly is saying, I love that all of your books take place in Vermont. I've never been there, but I feel I could navigate my way around solely from the books. How do you pick what parts of Vermont you write about? Um, are there ghost or folk stories tied to those places? Kelly, tell us where you're listening from today. And Jennifer, tell us the answers. Let's take that. Let's take that place by place. So, uh, sorry, part by part. How do you pick what parts of Vermont you write about? So I completely every part I write about is fictional. I, I invent my own towns, um, and there are definitely like ghost stories and little folk tales around Vermont. But like this is not based on anything in particular. Um, it's all I, I invent my own stuff. It's it's coming from my own head. When I sat down and wrote my very first published book, Promise Not to Tell, when I wrote out the rough draft, I had it set in a real town, and it was the town I was I had lived in for years and years. And I realized I can't do that. People are going to kill me. Like I'll go into the the little store, the general store. I'll go into the post office, and everyone's going to think I'm writing about them. The fire chief is going to be looking at me differently. Everyone's going to be looking at me like, mm, is this supposed to be me? So I totally like fictionalized it. And I've done that ever since. And I, I definitely have like specific areas of Vermont in mind mm -hmm. and little bits and pieces of towns. Um, but I, I'll create the town and try to make it as real as possible. And one thing that I do when I'm creating a town is um, I'll make a map. So for this book, I made a map of the town mm -hmm. in both the present day and then also back in 1929 when the hotel was there. And some things, and one of the things that fascinates me in my book and that in this book and in other books too is like how how places change, but some things don't change, you know, like the spring is there, the hills are there, the land, so much of the landscape is the same. And I'm also a big believer that places can hold memories. <gasps> um, so I liked playing with that a lot too. Oh, oh, I love that. Okay, cool. What do you mean they can hold memories? I think that places both like as a landscape and a house, I think anything that happens in a place is sort of absorbed by the place. It's kind of a flaky belief, I no, know. I and that's almost its, that. all, its own form of haunting, right? Like you move into an old house and it's kind of holding the ghosts of everyone who's ever lived there, whether they're living or dead. You know, it's like the, the house has absorbed the energy. Um, and I, I think that's its own kind of haunting. Absolutely. Actually, I just hosted um, MJ Rose, who's an Oh, I love her. She's wonderful. Yes. And she is, um, she's a bit of a mystic, actually a lot of a mystic. And we had a fascinating um, conversation about this stuff. And also Tatiana Derone, who believes that the walls hold memories. Yeah, um, I agree. And, oh, and wonderful. You feel that, right? You walk into a space, you're like, Ooh, this doesn't feel right to be here. Or you walk yeah. in and you're like, I'm home. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think sometimes when we go to a place that's supposed to be haunted, like I went to a haunted covered bridge. And um, I think that a lot of the time, a 
place that feels haunted feels haunted because so many people come to that place with their own expectations and their own beliefs and their own energy about it being haunted. And that kind of magnifies it and the place will pick up on that too. And whether it's haunted originally or not, it makes it, it, it like adds another level to the haunting, if that makes sense. You know, Ooh, that does yeah. make sense. And that's very cool. I want to go back to, um, let me go back to, uh, to the Kelly's, the second part of Kelly's question. Um, are there folk slash ghost stories tied to the places that you write about in Vermont? Um, not, not real ones. You know, I mean, I, I definitely like, I love collecting folk and ghost stories. There's a guy named Joe Citro who writes a lot of books about haunted Vermont. Um, and I love his work and I love, he, he's like collects folklore and ghost stories and stories about like the pig man of Northfield. And so I love reading all of that, but none of that, none of the actual stories ever really worked their way into my work, but definitely I get inspired. Oh, very cool. Um, thank you for thank you for sharing that. I had I had not heard of haunted Vermont. <laughs> so yes. haunted I'm, Vermont. I'm yeah. So yeah, Vermont. Joe Citro, he's got a lot of books about about Vermont hauntings and ghosts and lots of cool stuff, lots of fun stories. Oh, very, about very our little cool. green mountain state. And Kelly's telling us that she's watching from Baltimore today. Oh, I love Baltimore. Some yes. good eating in Baltimore. I love getting my crab shack on in oh. Baltimore. <laughs> Um, okay, Whitney. Oh, this is a good question. She said, we went to a hot springs in Colorado this winter, and I'm so glad I didn't read this first. I might not have gotten in, but this has been my favorite thriller slash scary story of the year. High praise, Whitney. Thank you for that. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I don't know that I would want to be reading it at a spring. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Kirkus said that, let me get exactly to it. They said that Kirkus said that this is a book which is best read during the, she said, no, I'm sorry. They said, it is, I want to get it exactly right. They said, this is best read on a dark and stormy night um, uh, in a well-lit room far, far away from the water. <laughs> So I think that that I think I think uh, Kirkus is speaking. I'm just gonna pop that for a second. Kirkus is speaking for all of us. So yes, definitely good that you didn't read that before you got in the springs. Um, Jennifer, let's talk about the springs. So when I don't know about you guys, but when I think of pool, I think of the town pool, you know, that your friend's pool and it's got the blue plastic liner and maybe those little, I don't know what it is, like a, a square pattern at the bottom and the chlor chlorinated water that you can smell a mile away. <laughs> Hashtag good memories. Um, but this is a very different pool, Jennifer. So this pool is, um, A, it's fed by a spring. It has its, so it has, it's not chlorinated. Um, it has weeds growing around the edges. You cannot see the bottom of it because it's so dark. It's black down there. It's freezing cold all the time. Um, it's cement. It's, it's freaking scary. Tell us about the inspiration of this pool. Yeah. So the pool was the first thing that came to me. That was what, that was the inspiration for the book. I began the book with a pool and I began the book completely based on a memory I had of a pool that I visited when I was a kid. When I was a pretty young child, my grandmother took me to visit a family friend down in Maryland. And my grandmother's a psychiatrist and this family friend was a psychiatrist. And he had a big, beautiful stone house. And behind the stone house was this stone lined, spring fed swimming pool. And the owner looked at my brother and I, us little kids and said, by the way, it's bottomless. The water was black. I'm terrified. I'm looking at this water thinking there's no way I'm going in this water. And I kind of dipped my toe in and you, it was so you could feel the cold coming off of it. And it was just like obsidian black lined with stone, supposedly bottomless, scary as can be. And but there's a little boy there who lives at the house and the little boy starts teasing me and calling me a chicken. And no way was I going to let a little boy call me a chicken. Right. No, no. So, of course, I do what I, I do, what I have to do. And I jump into the pool. And I'm in the pool and I'm freezing. I have never been in water so cold. I'm in the water. I can't see my feet. I can't see what's down there. I'm treading water, trying to stay warm. But the whole time I was in that water, I swore I could feel things like touching my feet and legs and kind of reaching up. I imagine things reaching up from the bottom of the pool. And I got out as quickly as I could while still saving face. But the memory of that pool has stayed with me my whole life. And I've always wanted to put it in a story. And I've always wanted to you know, do what I did and treat it as its own character and ask it, what's what's the deal with you, pool, and what secrets are you hiding? 
Um, and so I kind of, I, I thought about it for years and I kept trying to write my way into it and I would write circles around it and I would be like, oh, it's time to sit down and write the story of the pool. But I just, I didn't have it yet. And then one day I, one day I did, I got the idea for Jackson, Le Jackie and Lexi and I realized, oh, they are going to, this is the story of the pool. This is it. This is the story, this is of, the the story of the pool. Say, I, I am in my pool in. I'm on team edge. Like the little boy <laughs> call me a wimp all day long. I'd be like, whatever, little boy, I'm going to stay alive. <laughs> <laughs> I want to yeah. live. Oh yeah. my God. And it's, I, I, so the day the book came out, actually, my brother called me to say, he just picked up a copy and he's like, oh, you wrote about the pool. Because I hadn't talked to him to tell him I was writing about the pool. And he's like, you wrote about that pool. So we were sharing our memories of the pool and we were trying to remember more about that trip. And, and, um, yeah, it was, it was fun. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. Okay. So many great questions to get to. Whitney wants to know what was the first part of this book that came to you? Um, was it the spring or the characters? Um, it was the spring as a character. It was the, the, the whole book began with the spring and the spring kind of talking to me and me thinking that me writing about the spring. And I began the book describing the pool and I thought, well, people have died in this pool. Who's died in the pool? And I just started writing. And that's what happened. And then soon I had the character. Next, I had the character of Jackie and her sister, Lexi, who was drowned. Um, and once I had them, it was just like, I'm going. And I started writing and I wrote my way into that. And then I realized, oh, I have to go back and do something about the hotel. I have to show this this couple going to the hotel in the 1920s. And, and then Ethel was born and I started writing about Ethel. So it began with the spring. Oh, I love that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, great question, Whitney. Thanks for that great answer, Jane. Sylvia, um, saying the peacocks are there. Tell us about <laughs> the peacocks, Jennifer. Yeah, I thought that it would be pretty fun to put peacocks there. I, I'm thinking like, I was thinking about creating this like ornate resort that was very otherworldly and magical and storybook like. Um, and so I had the rose garden, this beautiful rose garden, and I'm writing about the rose garden. And I don't quite know where the peacocks came from, but they just came to me one day and I was like, there need to be peacocks roaming the grounds and, and they're there. Yes. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Sylvia is also wondering, is, uh, is this haunted covered bridge in Stowe? Yes, it is. Emily's bridge, Emily's bridge. Yes. I actually, so I went on, I, I go a lot because I have a teenage daughter. Um, and I actually went last Halloween and had a really creepy, like real life creepy experience <laughs> there. Okay, now we need there. to know the experience, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah. So we were there and I was there with my daughter. We were alone and we'd been there for a while and we were taking pictures and doing things and doing like the, you know, the, the teenage girl selfie. And, you know, where we parked the car and we started to leave because we'd gotten all our pictures and we hadn't had any, any encounters with anything there. So we parked the car in the center of the old covered bridge. And my daughter was leaning out, taking a picture. And I was kind of looking up and we had the windows open and I was looking up at the rafters and behind us, we just, I heard this laugh. And it was just, it was a really creepy little laugh and it sounded like a girl laughing. And I looked at my daughter Zala and she looked at me and we just clung on to each other. And she said, did you hear that? And I said, yes, did you hear that? And I did not get out of the car to investigate or take pictures. I just hit the gas and we left. And afterwards, I was like, we totally should have got out of the car, mom. We should have gone and like tried to talk to her. And no, I was scared. I don't know. And then I, and I was like, like, you know, playing. I was like, well, maybe there was someone under the bridge messing with us. Or maybe it was just the water running under the bridge. Or maybe it was some like animal. Maybe it was, I'm like trying to come up with all these reasonable, rational explanations to keep myself sane. And she was like, no, mom, you heard it. We both heard it. We know what we heard. <laughs> Thank God you had her there because otherwise you'd be questioning. I mean, if you were yeah. there by yourself, you'd be questioning all of this without the oh, yeah. validation of another, you know, hearing. Yeah. It. <laughs> oh yeah. <my> Sylvia is <laughs> saying she's been there. Okay. Now yeah. I need to Emily's to bridge. If you ever go to Stowe, Vermont, go to Emily's bridge. Absolutely. Let me ask you, um, ask you this. So, um, Jennifer, do you believe in ghosts? I do. I absolutely do. Why do you think I got off that bridge so quickly? <laughs> um, no, I, yeah, I believe that there's more to this world than meets the eye. I do. I'm, I'm open to the possibility always. And is that the only uh, creepy in, in you know encounter that you've had? Did you believe in ghosts before that, and that reinforced your belief, or or that was what caused the belief? Yeah, I've believed in ghosts my whole life. When I was a little kid, I was pretty convinced that we had a 
<clears throat> a ghost named Virgil living in the attic of my grandmother's house. I lived with my grandmother and um, I would, I, my bedroom was the bedroom that had the, like the pull down door that led to the attic. And I would dream, I would be in bed at night and I would dream, I guess dream, I don't know, maybe not, that the door would open and this man would come down and sit at the edge of my bed and talk to me. And I would wake up in the morning and I would draw his picture and I'd show it to my grandma who was, remember, was a psychiatrist. And then she's like, who's that, honey? And I, oh, that's Virgil, he's got a beard. He comes and visits me every night and tells me stories and he lives in the attic. And my grandma was like, oh, okay. <laughs> a wild imagination this one has, huh? Um, and then anytime we heard any noises from coming from the attic, like any like scrabbling or rustling or strange noises, I would say, oh, that's Virgil. And she said, no, it's got to be squirrels or mice or something. And she actually had an exterminator come to check out the attic and they didn't find any animals. And I said, told you so, it's Virgil. Yeah, so wow. I believed, I believed then. I mean, was he real? I don't know. Was he the product of my imagination? Probably. And was he a little bit of both? Who, who knows? I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, it's interesting because I see how you kind of wove that in with um, the the aunt Rita who who drowned in the book, and the two the two girls, well, the main protagonist, Jax, mm -hmm. um, and and her sister Lexi, um, when they are spending spending um, summers with their grandmother. Oh yeah, um, the grandmother's daughter, their aunt Rita, died in drowned in the pool, um, and their favorite thing to do is to um, see Rita's things and to play her favorite game because Rita drew inside the box a picture of her and her imaginary friend, mm -hmm. or is it? Um, and so, um, is well, that, yeah. that little bits of me in there? Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I had not put that together until just now, Sarah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I always thought I should have been a psychologist. Absolutely, little bits of me worked their way in, and I didn't even realize it until right now. Yeah, that's like my picture of Virgil. Yeah, I yeah. could, I could tell you what, what else I've noticed. What oh, boy. <laughs> um, Gail is a top community member saying, Wonderful premise sounds spooky. Gail, you are so right. Um, oh my gosh, I just looked down and realized we are out of time. So I want to make sure I get to everybody's oh questions because there have been so many. I'm just scrolling really quickly through um, to make sure because there's been so many great ones. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of these. Uh, Karen is saying, I agree with Whitney. This does to the swimming pool what Jaws did to the ocean. <laughs> Awesome. Yay, I love that. Thank Karen. you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Oh, wow. Karen, amazing, that's wonderful. Amazing praise there. Oh, we should put God. that on the cover. Yeah. Uh, that is a good blurb. Oh, okay. We have one here from Cheryl. She's saying, I would have done what the mother did if I had a baby and the only thing that would keep her alive was the spring. I would trade anything. You know it's going to take something in trade. I wouldn't care how haunting that she was trapped there for the rest of her life to stay alive. That haunts me. Uh, and gives me the chills. So yes, Jennifer, what made you think of that? What's the backstory to that part of the story? Uh, to, um, I, it kind of just came to me and the, pretty early on, I realized that the sort of the, the premise and one of the central themes of this book was going to be, be careful what you wish for. Hmm. And the spring will give you things, but not without a price. And the spring kind of takes things in equal measure to what it gives. Mm. Um, so, yeah, because that's yeah. a central theme in this book, but with both with the, the 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 spring and also the relationship with the sisters, yeah. um, Lexi suffering um, from some uh, mental health issues, um, in and out of hospitals, and on and off her meds, and Jax being the responsible sister who's trying to hold those boundaries. I mean, we all have family members that we try to hold boundaries with, so that that was an interesting, um, you know, theme that you wove in as well. Yeah, yeah. I It took me a little while to get what was going on with, with, with Lexi, and I didn't realize exactly what was going on. I thought she was just quirky at first. And then I realized there's something a little more serious going on here. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then I chose to make Jackie a social worker in the present day. Like she grows up, she can't fix her sister. So she grows up and tries to do this job where she can try to save other people in a way that she can't, couldn't, could never save her sister. Um, 
Yeah. I love what Booklist said too, which is that um, this supernatural thriller is built on gifted storytelling. Amazing praise for you there. Um, And the atmosphere of a fireside ghost tale woven with strands of longing and regret. Mm -hmm. Um, And and again, coming back to this trade-off, this idea that nothing, you can't get something for nothing and that there is always this trade-off, which I thought was really fascinating and sort of, and again, woven throughout um, and I mean, it, it is, it's a creepy book, right? We've got the creepy pool, but ultimately I feel like it's also, it's about how far we're willing to go for the people we love most. Right. You know? Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, Cheryl saying that she loves that the dad gets Lexi so well and all, and tell us about that. Yeah. I had a lot of fun with the, the dad character who, um, was kind of had his own struggles and was an alcoholic and kind of in and out of the girl's life when they were growing up. He um, moved away at one point and kind of went off to go and do his own thing. But he and Lexi have a special bond and had a special bond and they're both artists and both have different issues and struggles and they just get each other. And yeah, I had a lot of fun with him. Um. Sylvia saying, what a great discussion. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for your kind words and for joining us here today. We've loved having you. Um, Wendy Webb also loved your book. Wendy's been on the show as well. And that lady knows so great stories. Um, and has she shared her ghost encounter with our audience as well, involving a little girl on a a deserted uh, swing set, a playground that had not been, oh, had not been utilized I, for many years. I have chills just thinking about that. With, without even hearing the story, that's all I need to know. I, now, oh my gosh. Exactly. exactly. I need to hear and, the story now. Though. And chills. Um, Publishers Weekly praised your skill in creating captivating, um, let me pull this up, captivating plots. Uh, and building suspense. What do you think the key to building suspense is? Oh, um, I like to put in lots of twists and turns, keep adding in layers. But I mean, first and foremost, I have to give people readers that they're going to care about and read, Mm -hmm. uh, not readers, uh, characters they're going to care about. I have to give readers characters they're going to care about. And in order to do that, I have to make them feel real to me, which is where all that interviewing and hearing them talk in my head comes from. And once I've got them down, then I just put them through grueling torture. (laughs) I just heap one problem. You know, I give them a problem. I have them solve it. Then I heap on more problems and just problems on top of problems, lots of twists and turns. Um, And a lot of that, you know, doesn't come in the first draft. It comes in later after I've got the book laid out on the floor. How long did it take you to write this book? Oh, boy. Um... Well over a year, this one. Yeah. Usually it takes me about a year to write a book, and this one took me longer. This one went through many different incarnations and struggles, and yeah. And uh, and do you feel like that extra time has yielded your best book yet? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I really I had so much fun writing it, and it, you know, not only did I have fun writing it, but it probably scared me more than any of my Ooh. other books. Winter people scared me a lot when I was writing it, but this book scared me, you know? And I'm I'm one of those people who's very easily scared and freaked out. So I do scare myself when I'm writing. I'm, I, you know, I scream the loudest in horror movies. And if I'm reading a scary book, I have to sleep with all the lights on. And I'm, I am a big wimp. I am just a big scaredy cat. Um, so go figure that I should write scary stories. But I, yeah, whenever I was writing about the pool, I just, you know, I felt like I could hear things behind me and I've got that sense that like someone's watching me and I could, and I went back in my mind and was remembering being in that pool as a kid and feeling things reaching for me. And I'm trying to write about that feeling and, oh, I was so scared all the time. Oh my God. Absolutely. Cheryl is saying she thinks so too. Cheryl, you and me both. Um, Jennifer, you're also an Amazon editor's pick for the best mystery thriller and suspense book. Congratulations. Well earned, well deserved. Congratulations. Um, and I love to know that you scare yourself because I always wonder, you know, do you ever, and Chris is saying that, um, that he has wondered too, Chris, welcome. Um, he's wondering if you scare yourself. So do you always scare yourself or just this one? I do often scare myself and that's how I kind of know when I'm onto something good. I, you know, when you're studying writing in school, you hear this motto, write what you know over and over. And my own motto is write what scares you. 
I like Ooh. to write about the things that like keep me up at night and terrify me. And um, and so that's my own motto to the extent of which I like had it tattooed on my wrist when I turned 50. Yeah, I write what scared you, uh, write what scares you. Um, so that's what I like to do. That's where the good stuff is to like go down and explore my fears and not just run away from them, but like really look them in the eye, like really ask that pool, go back to my memories of that pool that I was in as a kid and ask it, what, what secrets are you keeping? What was up with you? Oh, I love that. I love that. Chris is saying, Chris is saying, woo hoo. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Oh, and she's clarifying that she's a she. I'm sorry, Chris. I saw your profile profile picture there, um, and I wasn't sure which one you were. So my apologies. Um, thank you to you for your great comments and your great questions. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, uh, all right, everybody, we have just two minutes left because we're actually over our time, but I want to make sure that you get all your questions in. So if you've got any last questions um, for Jennifer, get them going. Okay, Leslie's saying, they say write what you know and you know score. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> That's great. Um, Chris, uh, she says that she's scared to read this since she has a boat on Lace Lake Michigan. Chris? Oh, <laughs> don't read it while you're on the boat. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. read it when you're on the boat. <laughs> Don't read it late at night because I I was up late reading it and <laughs> and I was scared, you guys. Um, and she's saying that she forgives me that it's okay for the mix up in pronouns. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. And thanks again for being here. She would like to know, do you need a new painting? <laughs> Chris what? is so generous. Chris what? actually she wrote, she painted me a picture from inspired by my book, The Winter People, and sent it to me. And I have it hanging up in my office. It's very cool. Yeah. Oh my God. I that's know. So she is cool. she is wonderful. She is just an amazing, amazing fan, an amazing person. And it's it was such a gift you know to oh see that my my art inspired her art I love it it's so cool oh my gosh will you post um a picture of that in your Instagram stories later so that we can see Chris's beautiful painting absolutely your sure okay everybody follow um Jennifer um today on Instagram or Facebook and we're gonna she's gonna share us this share with us this beautiful painting that Chris who's joined mm -hmm. us today um made for her oh my gosh I can't wait to see it all right, everybody, we are out of time, but I just want to remind you to grab your copy. Um, oh, Chris is saying that she, this makes her so proud and happy to hear. Yay, Chris. Yay, Chris. Yay, Jennifer. This has been so awesome. I love this full this circle. really fun. Um, I just want to remind everyone to grab your copy of this editor's pick that has, has earned all of this incredible praise that this amazing author has given us uh, today on uh, bookshop.org so you can support independent bookstores and you can grab your copy of this gorgeous book, which I just dropped on the floor. But here it is. Look at this beautiful, beautiful cover, you guys. And um, I actually just joined TikTok and I made a book talk uh, to uh, Counting Stars. <laughs> so uh, go check out my book talk because it was pretty exciting to to take pictures of this. We're going to continue the conversation over on my brand new um, uh, Facebook group, Mystery and Thriller Maven. So if you love mysteries, come join us there. We do giveaways and we continue the conversation over there. So come join me. And we will see you right here next time on Mighty Mysteries. Jennifer, thank you so much. And thanks thank to everyone you. for your incredible time today. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank oh, you. One last, one last comment in from Kelly. She said, please keep writing. You are her favorite author ever. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone, for coming and for all the great questions and comments. I really appreciate it. Thank is you. the best group ever? It is the amazing. best group. And thank you so much for what you do, bringing this out to the world and sharing this with, with everyone. This is wonderful. Thank you. Oh, well, I love mysteries. I love thrillers. Chris is saying thank you, Chris Gray to have you can't wait to see your artwork later um, when Jennifer posts it but yeah everybody this has been you've been the greatest gr greatest group Jennifer you've been a wonderful guest um, and again we're going to continue the conversation over on mystery and thriller mavens and we'll see you right here next time on mighty mysteries have a great day everybody and thanks again bye all right thank